Welcome back to Straight Talk with Billy Kay. I'm Billy Kaiserling, the man who is lucky enough to be the mayor of my hometown. The purpose of this show, as, my, as is my website, is to help people in Beaufort and the greater area understand what's happening in the city. Um, we've had lots of different people, economic development, arts, culture, public safety. Uh, today it's a rather unusual show. Um, and before I say what it is, I would remind the listeners that this show is paid for by me personally. It's not uh, by the city. It's not by, it's sponsored by the station. Um, it's Billy Kay. And why it's different is that I have with me a political candidate. And it's history for me because I've never, as a public official, ever endorsed anyone else for public office. It started back when I was in the legislature and we got into reapportionment matters where I found Republicans, Democrats, caucuses were up in, <clears throat> up in Columbia dealing their own hands while forgetting the people back home. I ran as a petition candidate and was elected. And subsequent to that, with the exception of contributing to Senator Lindsey Graham, who was, a, who was a colleague of mine in the legislature, and a 40-year friend, Dwight Drake, I have never been involved. So I welcome and introduce to you my friend and the person I plan to endorse to be the next congressperson from District 1 in the state of South Carolina. And I'm doing this really, I'm a politician, everything's politics, but I'm doing this really because after thinking about it, Elizabeth called me several months ago and pumped me for information about the city, what are the issues, how do you work your budget, how have you dealt with the recession, <clears throat> what can a member of Congress do to help a city. We had a second phone call we talked more about that. She said, is there any chance you'd endorse me? I said, no, I don't get involved. She subsequently came to my house. We spent three hours sitting on the couch talking about the military base, about sequestration, about budget issues, about veterans, about <clears throat> military families and unique needs and how important that was to Buford. She asked me if I'd endorse her and I said, no. But when I really thought about it, and I quite frankly, when I read that having been a chief of staff in a congressional office myself, I read that the challenger had turned back $250,000 and brought staff money and bragged about it. I remembered how consi important constituent service is. I remembered how important, not the contributor who gives me $1,000, but the 80-year-old person on a social security check. And that was money that's used to work for the people. Beaufort is at a point right now where we need help. We need someone we can call in Washington who's going to pick up the phone, who will realize and recognize the, the, the limitations to what a member of Congress can do, but will put her best foot forward. So today I'm endorsing Elizabeth as our next congressperson. Elizabeth, you know, my mother was in the office for 16 years and many people said that she was naive, she was inexperienced. They threw everything at her to prevent her from winning. Mm -hmm. It turned out she spent 16 years being very distinguished, accomplishing more than probably any one period, person period, during that period. And she always said, well, it's probably because I'm not a politician. A number of people have waged that against you. You're not a politician. So why don't you tell me a little bit about, you tell me, tell, the, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and how this makes sense for you today. Billy, first of all, thank you so much for endorsing this campaign. It means so much to me. I'm honored that you considered doing it and that you actually did do it because I know I've been <laughs> coming after you right well, now. Well, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the people of the First District, quite frankly. Thank you. And I'm honored to have this endorsement. Thank you. Um, relative to my inexperience, I am not a politician. I am not a career politician. But what I am is a 25-year businesswoman who has spent 25 years in this community living 44 of them in this community, but spending 25 years in business in this community, learning to reach across the aisles, learning to discuss the important issues with everyone, learning to understand you have to negotiate to get a win-win situation, learning that if you don't talk to each other, no one wins. I have spent 20 years on the waterfront in the Port of Charleston. I was the director of sales and marketing for a major ocean carrier. When I began that job, I was the clerk and I worked my way up to Director of Sales and Marketing for a company called Orion Oversea Container Line. I covered the Southeast region, the Gulf region, and I was the country manager of Mexico. So in that 20 years, I have learned clearly that my experience as a businesswoman has brought me here to this spot today. 
after I left OCL, I went to Clemson University at the former Naval Shipyard, which was a closed base, which we all are aware got hit in the BRAC, the first BRAC. So I went to the shipyard with Clemson to bring my experience as a businesswoman into the academic sector to bring public-private partnerships together that industry and academia would come together to create jobs, research, development, and innovation. So 25 years in the waterfront community in District 1 covering business from international trade on the global level to developing job creation for the 21st century market that's coming our way. Academia, industry, public-private partnerships, it's our future, it's the 21st century, and we're going to prepare this district for that. And I'm honored to be here today. Well, let's get on to something really serious. Okay. Do you know who Candace Glover is? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> who doesn't Have you know? voted for who Candace doesn't? Glover? Well, let me tell you what we did yesterday. We had a huge rally in Charleston, South Carolina. And Billy, at the end of the rally, said, I have got to do one thing because I'm going to see Mayor Kaiserling tomorrow in Buford. <laughs> and there were 300 people there. And we said, you must vote for Candace Glover. You must tonight. And the place erupted, just absolutely <laughs> erupted. So I told everybody, send the message down to Mayor Kaisling. Job done. <laughs> Job <laughs> done. Job done. Speaking of jobs. Or I know you're very proud of her. We're I think that's extremely just Extremely proud of her. That's we wonderful. hope she'll be home next week. Yes. For, we hope she'll be yeah. narrowed down to one of the top three. She didn't have a good light in that light night last night because she had a cold. But oh. uh, it's hard to sing with a cold, but mm -hmm. she did a great job anyway. So she'll do she'll, very well. She'll be, she'll be there. We're rooting for you, Candace. Um, you know, something quite serious, yes. and particularly serious to this area, is our basis. Oh my goodness, yes. We spent two hours, if not more, Talk talking about, about the basis. Yes. And you basically said, I need to know. I want to know. I need to understand. That's a huge part of my job. You want to talk a little bit about our bases and our military families and some of your concerns and some of you think, what do you think are opportunities? I would be delighted. Um, first of all, I want to thank our military families for the service to this country. You put yourselves out there at risk every day to protect our freedom. And I am honored to be here to talk about your military bases here and the families and what we need to do to protect you. We just talked about a moment ago that I'm at the former Naval Shipyard in Charleston, South Carolina, where we were part of the first BRAC, and we're going through this, this commercialization, this industrial growth, and this job creation in our community. Um, it is something that we need to look at. We want to make sure that, first of all, the, the base here, we want to protect this base. We want to keep this base open. We want to make sure that this base is here, and it's solid, and it's protected. Secondly, the military families need to be rest assured that when I run for Congress and when I win this election, that I have your best interests at heart. I am your ally. I think you should make sure that you have all the benefits that you deserve, GI Bill, VA, and you should have priority for jobs first. This is what you should have. Now, I am a full supporter of the military, and we also need to look at potentially how do we come together in a private-public partnership for economic development to create more jobs in the, in the Buford area, to create more jobs in small businesses, which is the backbone of this country. After World War II, when the military, when our, our military came home, they became the backbone of the middle class and small businesses of this country. And we need to make sure that that continues on. So when we look at the private-public partnerships, the potential of creating small businesses, entrepreneurship, you have got a huge potential here an enormous potential for economic growth here based on that alone, aside from other things that you and I have spoken about. We need to make sure that that happens. Now, as opposed to my opponent, who voted three times not to raise military salaries, and he was the only member, one member out of hundreds, that voted against the transitional homes for homeless vets. That is absolutely not in support of our military active duty, our veterans, and their families. And I'm fully supportive of you all. It's really not in support of the backbone of our country, as you said. Mm. We're going to have to take the break right now. Thank you. Um, we'll be back in just a few minutes with Elizabeth Colbert Bush, candidate, excuse me, the next congressperson mm -hmm. from the 1st Congressional District of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you.
today I have with me Elizabeth Colbert Bush, who's the, going to be the next congressperson um, from the 1st Congressional District. Um, I endorsed her because I think she's good for the city of Beaufort, for Beaufort County, for the 1st Congressional District, for the state of South Carolina, and the United States of America. I think she's a very unusual woman. She's the first person I've ever publicly endorsed as an elected official, and she may be the only one, for all I know. It's not something I really get excited about, but I'm extraordinarily excited about an unusual person who's willing to leave a successful career, put herself, her ego, her family through the, through the traumas of running a political campaign and moving into a new world for us. Um, Elizabeth, um, everybody talks about the economy. Yes. Everybody talks about us being broke. We've been through the recession. We've had sequestration. The public is totally confused about where we are. Would you share with us, help us get straight on where the economy is and where we should be going and how you think about sequestration and is that really the way we want to run our government? I'd be delighted. Uh, I'd be delighted, Billy. Okay. I'd be delighted. Uh, sequestration, um, I strongly feel that this was handled poorly. To go across the board and do a massive cut across the board is like saying you need to lose eight pounds and you cut your leg off. It just makes no sense at all. As a businesswoman, that's not what you do. When you're looking at sequestration and you're looking at budget cuts, you're looking at what are my costs? Where is my waste? Where are my operational efficiencies? And once you get that in place, then you can determine exactly what's your benchmark, what kind of dollars do you have, and how do you cover your budget? It's a matter of simple business, it's not rocket science. So find out what the costs are, where are you wasting your dollars, and address those. Let me give you an example if I may. Medicare. Medicare has $166 billion in waste, fraud and abuse, overbilling, and the inability to negotiate our pharmaceutical contracts. $166 billion. The sequestration is $85 billion. That one department, although it's not hit by the sequestration, so we understand that, that one department is twice the waste, fraud, abuse, overbilling, and pharmaceuticals than the entire sequestration. Now, if that's true for this one department, imagine that has got to be true for, through other departments as well. We have to address these issues. We start there. So that would be my approach. That would be something that I would be very, um, very committed to, is to determine what are our costs. We have to get our fiscal house in order. So that's what we would have to do We were first. very fortunate in the city of Beaufort. We anticipated the recession. We yes. cut our budget by 20% before it ever hit us. It didn't hit us that badly. Brilliant. But what we found is we did more with less. People are so afraid to turn things upside down and reinvent them. And if there's, in my view, yeah. if Washington has the biggest problem, it's their fear of trying to do something differently. Different. Like um, <clears throat> one of the things that you and I talked about was, was a concept called city base. Yes. And that is um, is where communities work. It, a, it makes us rat proof, but more importantly than that, it helps the military with austerity. You want to talk a little bit about that? You, you've seen when you came in, you saw Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort, uh -huh. uh, the Proud Home, which would be the training center for the F-35B. Yes. Yes. Um, if, yes. If we get the money, if you save the money on Medicaid, then we'll, on Medicaid abuse. <clears throat> then, we, then we'll have the benefit of, of some of these things that the country really needs. Yeah, absolutely. And Billy, when we spoke at your home, I was the vision that you have for the city and the discussion we had for the city about how to do economic development, how this, this incredible asset of this military base that you have here can create incredible jobs, incredible opportunities through a public-private partnership. Some of the things that I found fascinating in our discussions were how you saw the future going with public-private partnerships, how you saw how you can help with these budget issues that we have, how the private sector can come to the aid of the public sector to say, I can help you with some of these things, I can help you with your costs, I can help you with your efficiencies. And when I heard you say that, you're the only person I've heard say that. I thought this is exactly where we're going in the 21st century. It's all about private-public partnerships and how do we do this together with limited resources. Mm -hmm. So if we have limited resources, we have limited dollars, then we work together and we use our common assets. And it's a brilliant strategy. Collaboration is what it's all about. We join fire, we join fire departments within joining city. Incredible. Saves us incredible money. We got smaller <laughs> fire trucks because we didn't need big fire trucks anymore because firemen have been so mm -hmm. good 
at prevention that the structural number of, number of structural fires is small. But you know, you think of, of, of But Billy, of, there of you are. It's a perfect example of cost efficiencies, what you've done. That's right. And it prepared you for this economy. That's right. It's brilliant. We've got the commanding officer of a military base, and he comes in for three to four years. The first thing is he's a city manager, because he's running a city, mm -hmm. inside a city. Mm -hmm. He then has to, in the case of MCAS, keep the F-18 alive because the F-35 is, is, is delayed. At the same time, he's got to begin to build a high-tech culture to get his people ready for the F-35. Mm -hmm. Now, if I could help him with some of his city managerial jobs and let him focus on what Department of Defense wants him to do, which is readiness, having the, the equipment prepared, having the equipment in shape, having his people fit, having his people ready to be deployed, which is what's been happening, then I'm helping him. And there are economies of efficiency, there are efficiencies yes. of economy by us working together. Right. So I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you heard that. Shared assets, shared resources. Right. It's we really brilliant. We've got to get out of this world of silos. That's right. Absolutely. And, um, I couldn't agree with you more. So um, you mentioned Social Security and Medicare. Mm -hmm. I noticed in this morning's paper that you were endorsed yes. by the group that is protective of and been yeah. working to 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 protect. I call these assets. Yes. And um, these are assets, and these are promises, and these are investments that the people out there have made. Mm -hmm. And to have it thrown and bandied around and played with mm -hmm. by the politicians. Mm -hmm. There I go again. I'm a politician. We're not all dead. <laughs> but the politicians to be sort of dangling this in front of people, mm -hmm. thinking that that's where the answers are going to be found. You started talking a little bit about the answers. But let's talk about that Social Security recipient who needs those dollars, who's, if they are lucky enough to have investments, mm -hmm. those investments dwindled. I'm passionate about this subject. Um, Social Security, first of all, is solvent. People are saying it's not solvent, but it is. It's solvent for about another 20 years. We need to look at Social Security two ways. One is, it is not an entitlement. If you feel the word entitlement means, I'm entitled because I paid for it, well, absolutely. Every time you have a paycheck, there is a box check that we put our money in for Social Security. To say you're going to take that away, I will not do that. When my opponent says he wants a voucher system, I completely disagree. This is something that was earned by the seniors, paid for by the seniors that they deserve to get back. Now, moving this ball forward after 20 years, we need to take that bipartisan approach like Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan did. Because when they came together in a bipartisan way, they made that solvent for 60 years. We have 20 of those 60 left. We need to come to the table and do it again. It's very important. When I saw, I went down to a, a place on Johns Island, South Carolina, and I knew how important Social Security was. I knew how important Medicare was. But it really drove it home when I met a woman named Miss Corrine. And we went and talked about how we were going to support Social Security, we were going to defend Social Security, and we wanted to make sure it wasn't diminished or taken away. After that was over, I went over and I sat down with Miss Corrine and her roommate. And she was very upset. She was, she was weeping. And I asked her, what's wrong? What's wrong, Miss Corrine? And she said, you have no idea what you just said and how important it is to me. It's all I have. My Social Security, my Medicare. She had no family, she had no one else, it's all she had. And if she lost that, she would have nothing. And then she just began to weep. And I looked at her and I said, don't be afraid, I will fight for you. <laughs> and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight. Well, it's, it's going to need a fight, yeah. but you know, I think it will be here. You know, I have one final question that I'm going to answer. And, oh, okay, and you're going to ask. How do I compare you okay. <laughs> to your opponent? But I'm not going to put great. you in the position because up to okay. date you've not really talked about him very much. No, sir. You've talked about what you think you can do. Right. In eight years as governor, as six years as congressman, Mark Sanford has never called, has never asked what Buford needs, has never said, what is it I can do to help you? has never invested in constituent service, I mean, serving those people whose Social Security checks are late, yeah. or saving those people who've had trouble with their Medicaid card, or helping that veteran who's who stumbled into a problem with the VA, or, or in, in another way with his or her benefits. Um, what I like is that I have no doubt 
that not only can I pick up the phone and call you, but you're going to pick up the phone calling us, yes. calling the Buford people of Buford, yes. and asking what it is you can do to be the best congressperson in the world to help Buford, South Carolina, and the 1st Congressional District. Thank you, Bing, Thank you. for being with me. Good luck. Thank you. Can't wait to see you at your victory party. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.